Okay, we're about to enter our Bible study this morning. We're going to be studying back in Leviticus chapter 2 via Ephesians 5 2. But before we begin, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's a time to use the rebound technique if needed. 1 John 1 9 tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments and I'll finish this out in a group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we're delighted to have our freedom and be able to come together as Christians without persecution. We're praying for our military men and women around the world who are fighting for that freedom. We pray that you would encourage them, protect them, enable them to neutralize our enemies wherever they exist. We pray for our police men and women here inside America that you would enable them to apprehend the criminals who seek to destroy our freedom stateside. We pray for our leadership in America and our elections coming up, Father that uh, we could have revival in America and that we could have conservative men and women who could guide our country and allow us freedom. We're praying for our friends around the world, our friends in Korea and the people of Ukraine and our friends in Israel, Father, and our military. We pray for our friends on the prayer list, the ones who are sick. We pray that you would heal them, whether it be by medicine or by miracle. For our friends who are suffering, we pray that you be with them in their pain. Remind them of your grace, which is sufficient. For our friends who've lost loved ones, Father, we pray you be with them in their grief. Remind them of your precious promises, which brings the peace that passes all understanding. We thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. We're actually studying in Ephesians, and we've taken a detour to take a look at the Levitical offerings. I want to review our verse one more time in Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love, imperative mood, voice of command. It means not only that we should walk in fellowship, the bottom circle, the divine dinosphere, also called the love complex, but that we should walk in agape love, that is the relaxed mental attitude of agape love. But our verse tells us that Christ represented what agape love is, and it became sacrifice. So what's this? And walk in love as Christ also. That means that Jesus Christ pioneered the Christian way of life, has loved us and given himself. It means as our substitute for us, an offering and sacrifice. And these two words are used to point to the Levitical offerings, which were a shadow Christology. To God, and that's God the Father, for a sweet-smelling aroma. And we know that is the satisfaction of God the Father's perfect righteousness. So we began to look at the Levitical offerings. And we saw that there is five categories. I'll review those quickly. We've covered the first one. That is the burnt offerings. Those had three subcategories from the herd, from the flock, or from the fowl of the air. The second category is what we're working on now. It's called the gift offerings. If you look at it in the King James, it says meat offerings, but there's no meat whatsoever. It meant gift, and they were all... Uh, bread offerings, if you will. The oven offering we covered. And remember, there were different types of cooking equipment used for each one. 
the oven offering was a closed offering and it pointed towards the Godward side of the cross. We saw the pan offering last week and that was really a griddle. It's the open cooking um, flat piece of metal that they cooked on and that was broken into pieces and mingled with oil as the scripture said and it represented Christ's appointment and him being crushed for us under the weight of the sin debt and this morning we're going to look at the final category of the gift offering it's called the frying pan offering frying pan offering we're going to go on to see the peace offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering. That will cover all five categories. The frying pan offering is covered in Leviticus chapter 2. In Leviticus 2.7 it reads like this, And if thy oblation be a meat offering, gift offering, minka, Bacon in the frying pan. Mar Chesef. That's Fry Daddy. It was a deep skillet. And they uh, dropped the mixture in and fried it. And um, when I was a kid, a lot of times my mom was a great cook and she always made something for Sunday morning and uh, the monkey bread do y'all remember that it was like biscuits covered in some kind of syrup I don't know with maybe some pecans or something on it it was super sticky it would almost pull your feelings out and it was just great man you could get carved loaded before you went to church and run in the churchyard <laughs> and if you didn't know it this scar right here on my lip came from running in the churchyard I we were chasing each other through the middle of the parking lot and uh we were zooming between the cars and somebody happened to be in the car i didn't know it and they opened the door right when i was coming by it i hit the end of that door right there with my mouth and it knocked me to the ground i got up and i kept running and it just went numb i didn't realize i had laid my whole upper lip open in my uh, we got ready to leave my mom said what happened to you i ran into a car door and she said oh my goodness and we had to make a little visit to the er but also on Sunday morning, she made a specialty. It was homemade donuts, and you took the cheap canned biscuits, and you got them out of there, and you poked a hole in the middle of it with your thumb, and you dropped it in the fry daddy and flipped it over once, and then you put it in a bag of powdered sugar, and, sh boy, you shook them up. I could eat two cans of those things. They were so good. Well, the Levitical offerings forbade sweetness, no honey, no sugar, but it was fried in a griddle or cast iron uh, fry daddy, if you will. It was a Dutch oven with no lid, but it had grease in the bottom. So this category of the gift offering was baked in a partially open, partially closed frying pan. The pan represented the cross as seen by both God and man. The closed side was analogous to the hidden side of the cross, while the open side represented man's view of it. In Leviticus 2.8, he goes on and says, And thou shalt bring Hiphil perfect of bow, that means to present, the meat offering or gift offering that is made, it's the Niphil perfect of asa manufactured produced of these things the flour and the oil unto the lord 
And when it is presented unto the priest, he shall bring it unto the altar. That's the brazen altar. So to present, uh, to demonstrate his faith in Messiah, the offerer was caused to present the priest to the gift offering, which had been made of the specific ingredients. The priest, in turn, shall bring or shall uh, be caused to come near, not cash, if he'll perfect the altar. What we have here is the portrait of our impeccable Savior as he went to the place of judgment. Hebrews 8.3, Hebrews 9.26b. And the priest shall take from the gift offering a memorial, askara, taken from the verb zakar, to remember thereof, and shall burn it upon the altar that is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Leviticus 2.9. Now remember that sweet savor is the satisfaction of, of God the Father's perfect righteousness. And that which is left of the gift offering shall be Aaron and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. Leviticus 2.10 Again, we see that a portion of the offering was to be burned upon the altar. The remaining part was kept by the priest as a memorial. The Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word askara is found in 1 Corinthians 11, 24. This do in remembrance of me. Now, every time we take the Lord's table, we mention this verse. The portion which was burned referred to Christ being judged for our sins. The portion which was called the memorial was eaten by the priests. Verses 2 and 3. What did it mean? Eating is a picture of faith. Eating is a non-meritorious activity. All kinds of people can eat. Good people, bad people, moral people, immoral people, religious people, irreligious people. There isn't a person who can say, I earned or deserved by my mouth, <clears throat> my tongue, my epiglottis, or my esophagus. God gave them to me because I'm such a nice person. This, of course, makes eating a perfect illustration of appropriating what God has provided in grace. And even as believer priest in the present dispensation, we partake regularly of the bread at the Lord's table. So the memorial became a portion of the priestly food. It's a fact that we all exist by grace and nobody earned to deserve the life that we received. Your mom and daddy didn't make you. And you wouldn't be here if God had not breathed the breath of life into your human body. It's at that point when you became a living being. And while none of us called ahead and say, God, can you impute my soul to my body at the moment I'm born? None of us paid for it. None of us earned it. None of us deserved it. Where every one of us are products of God's grace, and we entered God's plan by grace. So we started in grace, we're saved by grace, and we're going to finish in grace. That is dying grace. It's grace all the way. And so when you see the issue of eating of the arrest of the offering by the priest, it was a memorial unto God's grace reminding us that none of us are earn it or deserve it, but we simply exist 
by God's grace, and we keep going on in God's grace. I do want to uh, give you a summary of the gift offerings. These are the three that we've looked at, the oven, the griddle, and the frying pan. There were rules involved in giving these gifts, and each one of these rules had an application. They're found in Leviticus 2, 11 through 13. No meat offering or gift offering, which ye shall bring, that is, carab, unto the Lord, shall be made or manufactured asa with leaven. We've seen that. No yeast. For ye shall burn no leaven, nor any honey, in any offering of the Lord made by fire. So there's two things strictly prohibited in this verse, leaven and honey. Leaven is the Hebrew word kametz, and it means something sired or fermented. A familiar noun, kometz, refers to vinegar or sour grapes. Although the Jews ordinarily drank wine, they never touched the fermented juice of the grape on Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. On those two occasions, they drank boiled grape juice as we do at the Lord's table. Here's some uh, heretical teaching that you need to be warned about. Some denominations mistakenly teach that leaven represents the gospel. That sooner or later when everyone has been evangelized and the whole world is leavened, Christ will return. That concept has no biblical foundation whatsoever. The truth is that leaven is left out of the offerings because it pictures sinfulness. Be sure that you have it straight. Leaven is verboten. That means it is out. There was a second item that was not uh, permitted and perhaps a bit more difficult to deal with is the prohibition nor any honey. Honey stands for natural sweetness and refers to human good. The doctrine of human good will help you understand why honey had to be omitted. Now when you see good in the Bible it comes in three categories. Remember there is Establishment good, which is good for time. It comes from the adherence of the laws of divine establishment and its four divine institutions. Uh, let me give you an example. Nations have borders and languages. And uh, used to they had race, but it's, that's not a thing anymore. <clears throat> so when you adhere to the principle that we need to remain independent nations upon the earth what happens is it frustrates satanic control whenever you have hundreds of nations and hundreds of leaders on the earth satan has a hard time controlling the whole globe but when you have one leader of the earth one government then Satan has an easy target, right? As long as I can get this guy under my influence, I've got control of the whole world. Well, guess what's going to happen in the tribulation? One government, one world leader, one religion. Maximum satanic influence on the earth. And so that's why we need to remain independent nations on the earth. Also, under the idea of nationalism, every nation should have a military and uh, that they should be well organized and that they should be ready uh, to defend their own country at any time. And so at any time in human history, there has been wars and rumors of wars and there will always be belligerent nations and belligerent leaders upon the earth who are willing to invade, who are willing to besiege, who are willing to rob, steal, destroy, pillage, all of these things 
so that under the principle of nationalism, every country should have its own military and they should be fully trained and fully staffed and fully ready to engage the enemy at any given time. And guess what? When you, when you function under just those two principles, you produce establishment good. It's good for time. It produces maximum freedom, and under maximum freedom, you can do two things. You can send out the gospel, and you can teach Bible doctrine. And so, uh, when you function under establishment good, it's good for time. There's also divine good in the Bible, and that is the good that's produced by the believer in fellowship. It's described in uh, 1 Corinthians 3 as gold, silver, and precious stones. And it is the good that is spoken of, of John in John 15, where Jesus says, Apart from me, you can do no good. That means that the good that the believer does in fellowship is rewardable for time and eternity. Blessing in time, reward in eternity. So that we need to learn how to operate in the bottom circle so we can produce divine good. That's when we're under the influence of the Spirit and we can be led, guided, and directed by Him into producing all kinds of good. And Jesus says, if you give a cup of cold water in my name, that's in the bottom circle, I assure you, you have reward in heaven. But there is a third kind of good, and here's the phrase, all good is not good. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they ate the forbidden fruit, what did they do? They realized their nakedness, and they made clothing out of fig leaves. All good is not good. And Christ came, and he killed an animal, and he showed them this was the first death. It was very dramatic that they had seen. And he said, the same way this animal died, I am going to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world, spiritually. Now take these clothes that I'm making from this animal skins, and it represents my good of the cross, my work, and put these on. And they had to take off the fig leaves. That was human good. Operation Fig Leaves, and they put on Christ's righteousness, his good. So all good is not good, and we're going to study the doctrine of human good, and it stinks, if you will. Human good is no good, and honey represents human good. It doesn't matter how sweet you are, how kind you are, how nice you are to other people. You're not getting into heaven without the work of Christ on the cross. Take off your fig leaves. Can you hear me? And that's the reason there's going to be a lot of good people in hell and a lot of bad people in heaven. A lot of people think they're good enough to get into heaven. They're not. Human good. A lot of bad people know they're bad and they know they're not acceptable to God. Righteousness and therefore they say, I need a savior and Christ is mine be a lot of bad people in heaven because of that. Let's look at the doctrine of human good. No honey in the sacrifice. Human good is identified as dead works in Hebrews 6.1. So you can work your tail off under religion and it is dead works. And a lot of times, the busiest person around the church is trying to pay God back. They, they have a guilt complex that they are dragging around, and they can't wait to pull their skeleton out of the closet and say, look how bad I've been, God, and they beat themselves up, and the way that they express it is staying busy for God. And uh, it's not right. At the moment of salvation, God forgave all your pre-salvation sins. It's called the doctrine of the big blot out. 
And every time we use 1 John 1, 9 correctly, God forgives and forgets. And the Bible says he separates our sins as far as the east is from the west. He buries them at the bottom of the sea, and they're never to be remembered anymore. So don't function under dead works principle. You can't pay God back. We exist under grace. He forgives by grace, and he can't remember anymore. Point two, human good will not save mankind. Two of my favorite verses, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by his mercy he saved us. And the word saved is sozo, and it's in the tense, which means he saved us at one point in time, and that salvation continues forever. Point three, human good is not acceptable to God, neither as an unbeliever or a believer. Isaiah 64, 6, Romans 8, 8. Isaiah 64, 6 says, Your righteousnesses are like filthy rags in my sight. Point four, human good is condemned by God, the unbelievers in Ecclesiastes 12, 14, and the believers at 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 16. Now, if you understand the great white throne, you can actually throw in there also uh, Revelation, I believe, 21. Let's see here. No, it's Revelation 20, 11. Through 15, it says the unbeliever is actually going to have his good, ergon, his good judged, not harmatia, not sin. And you say, well, I, I thought everyone was going to stand for their sins. No, Christ stood for sins on the cross one day for three hours. God's not ever going to mention any man's sins again. But he is going to mention all the good that anybody ever did. And the unbelievers, good is going to be weighed against Christ's good, and it'll never measure up. Ergon is the word that's used for work. Not harmatia, not sin. And that's the unbeliever. But the believer is also going to have his good judged, the good he did out of fellowship. And all of us have done good out of fellowship. And that good is going to be, uh, it's like wood, hay, and stubble going through the fire. What happens to those things? It burns away. And in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 16, it says, the believer who never, never liked doctrine. They never recognized that they, they had a priesthood and they needed to operate undefiled in the priesthood. They don't like those spiritual concepts. They're going to have their good ran through the fire and they shall suffer loss, it says. But they are going to be saved forever. Saved forever, it says. That means they'll go on into eternity future with a resurrection body, and they're going to be happy, 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 and they're not going to shed a tear anymore, and there's going to be no more death and no more dying and no more pain, and they, it's impossible to be sad they're just going to go into eternity without their reward. Point five, human good is the basis of the indictment at the last judgment. This is the verses I was 
telling you about. Revelation 20, verses 12 to 15. And the whole basis of this is weighing the unbeliever's work against Christ's work. And there's going to be a lot of unbelievers that, that uh, produce a lot of altruism, that produce a lot of uh, humanitarianism. And I'll tell you right now, there are people in the world right now that are suffering immensely under third world problems. We have no idea what, what it's like to live under that kind of pressure where you can't get to clean water and the, the supply of food is not there. But I am telling you that it is better for a child to die under third world problems than it is to go send a lot of humanitarian aid without the gospel See, that don't compute to you who are sweetness and light. But it is better for a child to die before the age of accountability and them go on into eternity with God than it is for them to grow up healthy and strong after all your humanitarian aid and not get the gospel. You see that? That's why it's human good a lot of times when you're sending your money to a uh, country that is negative towards the good news about Christ. And that, that's a hard pill to swallow. But I'm telling you right now, you better not follow your bleeding heart in where to give. You better not look at these pictures of these emaciated children and give. You better follow the leadership of the Spirit in your giving. And I had a pastor friend who was dead set on drilling wells in Africa and uh, because they were in drought and people were dying because there, there wasn't water or wasn't clean water. And it was a Muslim country in North Africa and they were negative, negative, negative and he, they... The government said no Bibles in the country. It's illegal. And my pastor friend, he had a he had a water drilling rig, and he had a warehouse there where he kept his equipment at, where they kept Bibles in there by the droves. And he would take and send those things out wherever he drilled for water. Well, the government found out what he was doing and they seized his bank account and all of his assets. That means all the money that people were giving into his ministry was seized. And that was a lot. And they seized his warehouse and his drilling rig and all the Bibles. And then he refused to give up. And this guy lived in North Arkansas. I talked to him several times. He refused to give up about this one country trying to drill water wells over there. And uh, he died on his farm. His tractor flipped over on him and, and killed him. And I'm telling you, it is better for a child to die before the age of accountability than it is for them to grow healthy and strong and well fit without the gospel. You see that? And you go through and you, you do these things and you're not functioning under the leadership of the Spirit. You're functioning under the bleeding heart, the altruism, the humanitarianism. And you can't see the spiritual, the spiritual principles underneath. Point six. Human good includes sweetness of disposition plus sincerity. Neither can propitiate the Father. No honey 
the, the verse says, no honey. And see, what I'm telling you is very hard to swallow. It's not sweet at all, is it? And that's the reason there was no honey in the offering. No sugar, no sweetness. So point seven, Jesus Christ did not possess an old sin nature, therefore he could not produce human good. As the oil permeated the fine flour in the gift offering, so the humanity of Christ, controlled by the Spirit, produced only divine good. Now, some of you have no problem with this because everybody has a trend in their old sin nature. Some of you have a trend towards antinomianism. That means lawlessness. That means you're a pirate at nature. What do pirates do? They drink, they murder, they steal, they kill, they destroy, they cuss. They make their uh, enemies walk the plank, don't they? They're after the plunder. And it's always a good time aboard the pirate ship. Antinomianist. But there is also the ascetic. And the ascetic would never do any of those things. They're sweetness and light by nature. The, they, they're kind in their personality. They're full of asceticism. They're full of altruism. They're full of humanitarianism. And they play into the plan of Satan in whitewashing this in devil's world. So you have to, it's very tough to know if you, are, if you suffer under asceticism to watch people suffer in the world. And that's why there's no honey. No honey included. And this is another reason that uh, there was also the animal had to be sacrificed in the burnt offering. It was to destroy that ascetic nature. And if you take someone who's sweetness and light, they can't look at an animal and they can't see it die. They just have a, such a hard time with the killing of an animal, but it represents the fact that all of your kindness, all of your sweetness cannot make you acceptable to God. It is Jesus Christ's sacrifice, and this animal is a vivid representation of the three hours on the cross where Jesus would die spiritually. So there's the doctrine of human good. No honey, no leaven, was allowed in the offering. Now, a second thing I want to summarize before we take our break and head on to a new subject was the feast days were separate from the Levitical offerings. There were seven festival days that were separate from what uh, happened at the Levitical offerings. The Levitical offerings were, um, they were not uh, commanded. They were just uh, over and above offerings that you would bring in. And uh, most Jews at one time in their lifetime would offer a burnt offering of some sort. These feast days were commanded by God, and there were seven of them. And they all had different representations. And I want you to see this in your mind. The Levitical offerings, distinct and separate. The festival days, distinct and separate. And there were seven different festival days. And uh, I'm, I am blessed with health. And uh, I am blessed with a go get them attitude. And there's hardly a day that I will ever miss work. And... Uh, Anybody that uh, I work with will tell you, oh, Brad, he'll be there. Don't worry. 
I'm always there. I actually, a lot of times, I could, I could get there if I needed to ride my bicycle. I can make it. I can get there. It's only seven miles. I can run seven miles in one hour. I can be at work. I might be a few minutes late, but I can get there. Well, guess what? I, I thought about telling my boss, you know, I don't miss a lot of days at work, but today is the festival of unleavened bread, and I'm taking off. He probably looked at me with a peculiar look on his face, but guess what? If you follow uh, Judaism, you would be off of work. So let's look at the festival days. These were times where the Jews did not work. There was no work to be done. They were special Sabbaths. In their yearly time schedule, the Israelites were to keep seven festivals, each of which had a special meaning. By the way, these were uh, affixed to a lunar calendar and... If you look at when Resurrection Sunday falls for us, and this week it's the last week of March, it's because of the lunar calendar. That's what we follow in affixing uh, our Resurrection Sunday. And uh, the Passover was uh, the precursor to um, Resurrection Sunday. So the Passover spoke of the cross and Christ, our Passover, sacrificed for us, spoken of in 1 Corinthians 5, 7b. So Jesus was the Lamb of God, takes away the sins of the world. And therefore, we don't celebrate Passover anymore. We celebrate the real thing. And uh, we take a look, back, a look back at what Christ did at the cross. The next festival was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which followed the Passover and lasted a whole week, no work, a whole week of no working, and it represented fellowship with God in time. Now on the first Sunday of that week, it was the Feast of First Fruits. It foreshadowed the resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus is the first fruits, it says. So that was the first three festivals. You had the Passover one day. You had the Feast of Unleavened Bread one whole week. And then you had the Feast of First Fruits at the end of that. You had one big, long uh, series of days where you were off of work and you were thinking doctrine is the point. Then there's a gap. And that gap represents the church age, the mystery Next, the Feast of Trumpets. That was in the fall. It represented the second advent. You're going to hear the trumpet call of God and the voice of an archangel at the rapture. But there's also, seven years later, will be the actual second advent where Jesus Christ sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives. That's the Feast of Trumpets. It had an emphasis on the end of the fifth cycle of discipline to Israel and the gathering of Israel. After that came the Day of Atonement. That represents Israel's national conversion anticipated. depicting the result of the baptism of fire with only saved Jews going into the millennium. Remember, if you're going to receive the promise that was given to Abraham, you have to be a believer. 
only believing Jews. Finally, there was the Feast of Tabernacles. I like this one because the Jews still do this in Israel. They'll go camp out in the backyard. They make a rickety shed or shack. They camp. And uh, a lot of times they make palm leaves and they set up a camp. Well, when, when Jesus rode into town on the donkey's colt and they laid down the palm leaves in front of him, guess what? They were telling him, deliver us. Bring on the millennium. But you can't have the crown without the cross. And they wanted to skip right over the Day of Atonement and Passover. They wanted to skip right past that and go right to the Feast of Tabernacles where the Jews are delivered and they live under Messiah. It spoke of the millennial reign of Christ. That's what the palm leaves represent. Well, there is the seven feast days, and they were separate and distinct from the Levitical offerings. And so when you read your Bible, you have to recognize that while Levitical offerings were uh, personal, the all of Israel celebrated on these feast days every everyone at the same time okay we'll take a break right there we're going to move on to the next one after f uh, about five minutes and powerful sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of the, the soul and the spirit the joints and the marrow and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart all scripture is god breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be matured, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself an approved workman unto God who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're going to move on to a new category. We covered two categories so far, and uh, we're going to move on to Category number three called the peace offering. Peace offering. You may have heard the, that sermon called Peace with God versus Peace of God. And uh, there's a difference when you see the word peace. Eirene. The peace of God that is supposed to, um, every believer is supposed to have, but not many possess it, comes from claiming the promises of God and mixing them with faith. It's called the faith rest drill. And so the, fee, the peace of God is supposed to uh, indwell the believer. And that means that in the middle of the vicissitudes of life, the testings of life, the storms of life, we are trusting in God and His plan and His promises and that it produces a tranquility of soul that keeps us calm and stable and uh, in the fight, if you will. It's called the peace of God. But peace with God is a different matter because uh, as a member of the human race, you were born fallen. And you, as a human, no matter how nice you are, are the enemy of God being born as a human. And the peace offering taught the absolutes of spiritual status. For the unbeliever is an enemy of God. 
He's called the seed of Satan because he's dwelling in negative volition. He's at enmity with God. Well, if we were born as enemies, how do we make, be brought near? And that was the doctrine of reconciliation. It's found in Leviticus 3, verses 1 to 17. The peace offering illustrates the doctrine of reconciliation, which is the manward side of the cross. Apart from the work of Christ on the cross, there could be no korban offering for man's sin, and his consequences had erected an impassable barrier between God and man. Since man put up the barrier, man cannot remove it. But by his work on the cross, Jesus Christ, the God-man, reconciled man to God and thus abolished the barrier. The animal sacrifices clearly taught this principle. So reconciliation is aimed at man. Propitiation is aimed at God. You have two sides of the same coin. And if his oblation, that's offering, be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it of the herd, whether it be male or female, he shall offer, that's carab, he shall cause to draw near it without blemish before the Lord. Levit Leviticus 3.1 The word shalimim means peace in the Hebrew. It's in the plural. The peace being shalom. And uh, the Israelis still use this greeting today. If they meet each other on the street, shalom. A literal translation of this word, peace is offering, would be awkward in our language, although there are two kinds of peace in view. Peace through the blood of his cross, mentioned in Colossians 1.20, and peace with God, Romans 5.1. We have to reiterate something that the physical death of Christ on the cross did not provide our salvation. It simply indicated that his work on earth was terminated and formed the basis for his resurrection. Remember when Jesus cried out, Tetelestai? He said, it is finished. That means the work of salvation was completed and he was still alive at the moment. And then he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he gave up the ghost, the Bible says. So the work of salvation was completed in three hours on the cross. And it was completed before Jesus even died physically a moment before. In Isaiah 53, it uses the word des. It says uh, he was with criminals in his deaths, plural. Over to, Jesus died twice upon the cross. He first died spiritually, being separated from the Father under the penalty of sin. He became sin for us. And then he died physically after his work was completed. So when we read five, Romans 5.8, that God keeps on proving his love to us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, it refers to his spiritual death. It is the spiritual death of Christ that is related to salvation. By removal of the barrier, Christ made it possible for man to have peace with God. Peace with God. The peace offering differed from the burnt offerings 
in that either a male or female animal could be used. Some may wonder if this is really an important point. Indeed it is. Otherwise, the sex would not have been spe specified in God's instructions. Every detail acted as a teaching aid. Leviticus chapters 1 and 2 presented propitiation from the standpoint of the person and the work of Christ, a male in his humanity. Hence the significance of the male bull and the male goat and the male lamb. That's under the burnt offering. The bullock, you would know um, that as an oxen, is an obedient work animal. And this obedience depicted Christ's perfect compliance with the Father's plan. For phase one, there is an active obedience found in the specification of the male. There is a passive obedience found in the alternative or female. Because man, males, by nature are aggressive and active, while the woman, by nature, is passive and responsive. The male and female become excellent illustrations of volition. Therefore, the bull prefigured the positive volition of Jesus Christ which took him to the cross. Obedience unto death, even the death of the cross. And you, you realize what it took for Jesus just to get to that cross under the severe, uh, savage uh, beatings and the uh, things that were done to him. It took a tremendous amount of strength and uh, testosterone, if you will, to get him to the cross. And that was aggressive volition, him fighting to get there for you. You see, Satan would, would love it if Christ wouldn't have mounted the cross. And he did everything in his power to keep him from getting on that cross. And that's what we see in all of the torture beforehand. It took strength, it took muscle, it took fortitude, it took endurance, it took a sense of his destiny, seeing you walk down the golden streets of heaven is why he did it, why he fought for you to take the nails. And if you've ever done any endurance work, you know it, it, it takes a certain amount of strength physically and that has to be built up over time and for the male it means that not only is his endurance building up but his strength and uh, his the male body produces testosterone which helps uh, build muscle and endurance and if you've ever seen uh, the bullfights that they have in uh, south of the equator, you'll realize the bull itself is full of testosterone, those fighting bulls, and they seem like they don't even feel pain. And they can endure a tremendous amount before the uh, Spaniard, whoever he is, finally puts him out of his misery. Well, that's the male going to the cross, enduring all of the uh, torture and making it there. Philippians 2, 5 and 9. That's active obedience as seen in the male sacrificial animal. It showed his willingness to go to the cross. However, once he hung on that cross, active obedience became passive obedience. And this is where the female comes up. How was his passive obedience manifested? In his willingness to bear our sins in his own body, 1 Peter 2.24. In receiving the judgment which belonged to mankind, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Christ endured the awful, fathomless wrath of God 
when it was unleashed on him. Such endurance we can only understand in principle, for it would have been easy for him to come down from the cross. What an offering it was for sin, Hebrews 7.27. So passively, Jesus Christ was willing to accept sin. The imputation of the sins of the world. I love it when he asked his disciples, Are you able to be baptized with the cup? I am about to be baptized with. And it was a rhetorical question because no, they weren't qualified. He was the only member of the human race who was qualified. And he received that cup of suffering containing the sins of the world, which God the Father poured out on him. And he became sin for us. So we have the doctrine of reconciliation. This is how we have peace with God through Christ's work on the cross. A lot of false teaching in the world. A lot of people say, we're all children of God. You know, we're all brothers and sisters. I hear that song on the radio continuously. We're all in the same boat. Fishing in the same hole. You know, they're trying to tell us that the human race is one. And that is wrong, wrong, wrong. All you have to do is look at the story of Noah. And you will find the exact opposite. Narrow is the path that leads to righteousness. That's faith alone in Christ alone. Only eight people on the boat and the rest of the members of the human race perished in the flood. We're not all in the same boat. And we were born as enemies of God, as members of the human race. We need to be reconciled to God. How will it ever happen? That's the question. Point one, the principle of reconciliation is found in Ephesians 2, 14 to 17. We're going to look at these verses later. Reconciliation is the first work of God from which man benefits eternally. The Father planned it, the Son executed it, the Holy Spirit reveals it. So the peace offering could be male or female and it taught the doctrine of reconciliation. Point two, the concept of reconciliation. A, in reconciliation, the unbeliever is regarded as the enemy, ekros, of God. Romans 5.10, Colossians 1.21. And the barrier between God and man is called enmity, ekthra, Ephesians 2.15 and 16. The removal of the barrier is known biblically as reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5.18, Ephesians 2.16, Colossians 1.20 and 21. If you look at this in relation to the slave market of sin, reconciliation is the door being opened and all that it takes for the slave to do to walk out of that slave market is faith alone and Christ alone. We've all been freed, but you have to let yourself out.
Point three, under the doctrine of reconciliation, the communication of reconciliation in the Old Testament was accomplished through the peace offerings. That's what we're studying. Leviticus 3, Leviticus 6.30, Leviticus 7.37 and 8, Leviticus 8.15. All of these offerings mentioned portrayed reconciliation. Point four under the doctrine of reconciliation, the basis of reconciliation is the cross of Christ. Ephesians 2.16, Colossians 1.20. Somebody said, I can't wait till we get to heaven and we finally get to stop singing about the cross and the blood. But they never read Revelation. It was right there in Revelation, it says we're going to sing a song. It says, worthy is the lamb who was slain. That's the cross. So we're never going to outlive the cross. It's God's grace directed towards man and the basis of our own reconciliation. Now that means that the basis of our reconciliation is not us uh, being a Baptist. It's not our daddy being a deacon. It's not us having our name on a building. It's not us working our tail off for Jesus. It's not us doing anything. You can't be baptized for reconciliation. You can't give money to the church for reconciliation. You can't walk the aisle, pray the sinner's prayer, cry tears of repentance, tarry at the altar. Uh, none of those things will bring reconciliation. It's the cross. The cross is where Jesus Christ reconciled man to God. Well, we're going to continue with the doctrine of reconciliation next week. I ran out of time on you. I want to thank you for your attention and attendance this morning. I'm going to pray with you. Let's bow our heads together for a moment. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for sending us as such a magnificent Savior. We thank you that he was revealed to all generations under the Mosaic Law, and even now we have the reality of history. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.